Hello, Chris on Noel. Welcome back to the channel. Jimmy here. That was a weird intro. I'm going to do that again. Hello, Chris on Noel. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, Jimmy here, and today we are going to talk about teeth. So there's been a, li a little bit of a, a blow up in the Viking reenactment world over the last couple of weeks about <laughs> it's niche blow up time about the uh, tooth modification that we see in certain skulls and skeletons from the Viking Age. So today we are going to look at what evidence we actually have that big, hairy, blonde Viking superhuman warriors were actually incising their teeth as some sort of elite bond. Uh, get ready for all the evidence we have for that. So let's start right at the top. Tooth modification is something that is notoriously difficult to assess from archaeology. It is so, so difficult to know how tooth marks got there. Teeth are fun and useful, and they can tell you a lot about the age and the diet and the health of the person that you've just dug up from the ground. But when it comes to modifications on them, Unless it's something really obvious like these Etruscan braces or these Aztec uh, jeweled teeth with jade inserts, just scratch marks and gouges in teeth, super difficult to tell how that was done. To the extent that it's difficult to know if they were on purpose or if they were accidental. It's really difficult to know that. My camera is focusing on you like you are another face in the room, which is good because it means that my picture of a skull is lifelike, hooray. Why do you modify teeth? You, you modify teeth for a few different reasons, and one of them is obviously dentistry. So we know that people have been drilling teeth since the Stone Age. People have been drilling into their teeth to try and cure problems with their teeth. Uh, they've been sharpening and blunting teeth for various reasons, filing teeth down to make them less sharp for a variety of reasons as well. Another reason to modify teeth is, of course, for that word, the, the cosmetic reasons. Another reason to modify teeth is for cosmetic reasons. So we know that people have been decorating their teeth. We know that the Aztecs de decorated their teeth. Yet another reason that you might modify teeth is for religious reasons, so spiritual reasons. There are uh, certain cultures in Africa and Asia that either remove, blunt, or sharpen their teeth for a variety of rituals, whether that is a coming-of-age ritual, marking that you've entered adulthood, whether it is a premarital ritual, signifying that you are now prepared for marriage, whatever it may be. The... Uh, Banishment of evil spirits comes into some of these rituals. It's really interesting why people do wacky stuff to their teeth. The wackiest thing I do to my teeth is floss them every day. And before we move on, let's talk about my teeth. Because people have been being mean about my teeth in some of these comments threads. Let me tell you something. My teeth are excellent. I have excellent dental hygiene. I have very good teeth. I've even got a baby tooth. There it is. That's a very tooth right there. It survived. No, they're not pearly white. And you know why they're not pure white? Because teeth aren't meant to be pure white when you're an adult. Na dental enamel yellows naturally, and my teeth are over 20 years old, completely unwhitened, and this is what teeth look like. And you know what? When you're dead, you're going to look like this, and your teeth are going to go brown with the tannin in the soil in a matter of months. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. The only reason people whiten their teeth is because Hollywood stars did it in the 50s. So get bent, drink as much tea as you want. Bunch of meanies. Yeah, this is what you look like if you don't join my Patreon. Ooh, this is what happens to you. I mean, it happens to all of us, but still. Unless you get cremated, actually. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Why did the Vikings modify their teeth? It's going to come as no surprise to most of you guys that we don't know. We have no idea. But we can work a few cool things out. So most of the tooth incisions, and most of them look like they're either inscribed, worn away, come from a variety of burial grounds. So we have burials in Burka, and most of these are from Gotland, actually, or Gotland. Is it Gotland or Gotland? Let me know in the comments. Is it G Go? G Gotland? Gotland. I feel like it's Gotland. Anyway, Burka, uh, Bolstanes, uh, Koppersvik, 
uh, we obviously have one from England, from Devon, from Ridgeway Hill. More on that in a minute, because that's a super cool find. And all of the teeth belonged to adult men. They were all adult males. As far as we know, this was something that adult males did. When you talk about adult males in the Viking Age, people automatically assume Viking warriors. Raiders going off and fighting and whacking monks on the head and stealing their gold and that kind of jazz. But the problem with that is some of the nuances of these finds mean something different. So let's take a look at some of the Burka burials. So there are a couple of the burials in Burka that have some evidence of trauma. There is evidence from the Bolstanace burials of trauma as well. And there's evidence of trauma, that is, damage to the skeletons, in the Ridgeway Hill burial. The Ridgeway Hill burial in Devon, in England, consisted of more than 50 adult males, ranging between 16 and mid-50s, all of whom had been decapitated somewhere in the 10th or early 11th century. The working theory is it might be something to do with the St. Bryce's Day Massacre, which basically involved all of the adult Scandinavians in England being killed on the orders of the king. Not just the warriors, everybody. Which kind of makes sense, because the place where they were found was firmly under English control. They wouldn't have been raiders at that point anyway. They'd have probably been settled, maybe living as merchants or fishermen or farmers. So that makes a lot of sense. Of the, I think, 54 skeletons, and editing Jimmy will put it on the screen. Thanks, Bob. One of the skulls had modified teeth. One of them on two incisors. I mean, you don't really get more than two maxillary incisors, but still. The two incisors, the two maxillary incisors, had been ground down. So they were furrows, trenches, like V-shaped trenches in the two front teeth. One of these guys had that. I haven't been able to find out the specific age of this particular skeleton. If anybody knows a, a source that mentions the actual age of the skeleton, do let me know. And none of the rest had that. None of the rest had this dental modification. Way over back in Bolstanes in Gotland, in Sweden, I think it's Sweden, there is a young man, probably in his 20s, who was buried in the very early Viking Age, sort of right at the start, late 8th century, and this poor dude was buried with another man in a cremation mound. He wasn't cremated, he had his head chopped off and was dumped in somebody else's grave. The working theory for this guy is that he was a slave, a thrall, to this other guy, this older man that was buried with him. And the older man was buried with a shield and weapons, he had a spear, he had arrowheads. So this guy almost certainly was some kind of either warrior or at least a fairly high up member of society. The tooth modifications on the younger man... Oh. Yeah. I forgot that bit. Um, the elite warrior, high social class guy, he didn't have modified teeth. The tooth modifications belonged to the young man who was decapitated and dumped in the grave with him. Uh, oops. In fact, a couple of the people that we have from Burka, the suggestion is that they weren't warriors at all. In fact, the Ridgeway Hill burial in England, there's no evidence of any kind of warfare or other skeletal suggestions that they were warriors. And actually, an awful lot of the burials we have from Gotland are from very much a solid Christian context. Um, guys, it doesn't look like this was an elite Viking warrior thing, I'm really sorry. I buried the lead a little bit there to try and get my view time up, but yeah, there's no evidence, really, that this was some kind of elite Viking warrior club mark. But hold on, because there is some really interesting evidence that this is to do with something else. If you've ever had a lip piercing, okay, and your parents probably told you not to because it could be bad for your teeth and you probably ignored them, and they were right, because <laughs> there's evidence that the ball 
of a lip piercing, if you like play with it and like move it around like that, that can chip and wear away the enamel of your teeth. So, rather than being just like an intentional, you know, somebody just decided, I'm a Viking adult man now. <laughs> Odin. It's just as likely, in fact, it's potentially more likely that this was accidental wear. Like I said, it's really, really difficult to know how dental marks get there in a skeleton, especially a skeleton that's been in the ground for a thousand years. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between accidental rubbing away of the enamel and uh, intentional rubbing away of the enamel, unless there's obvious knife marks. And on the majority of these, they've been looked at under a scanning electron microscope, and there's no real evidence to suggest that many of these scratches were intentional. Some of them, there's build-up after uh, the marks have been made, which suggests that either they stopped doing whatever it was that made the marks, <clears throat> they forgot, or some of them there's evidence that it was done relatively close to death, implying that either whatever was done was done just before they died, or they'd carried on doing it until almost the time where they died. So did the Vikings pierce their lips? Maybe. Maybe they had a lip piercing of some sort. There's more evidence to suggest that it was something to do with crafting, so making something, tool use. And how many of you have, for example, torn open a packet of crisps with your front teeth and your mam has said, don't do that, it's bad for your tooth enamel? I've never done it, obviously. Me? Who, me? Who, me? With the gorgeous teeth? I don't think so, baby. It's bad for your teeth. It can wear your teeth down. It can wear the tooth enamel down. If you, say, use your teeth as a vice grip because one hand is holding something and the other hand has to cut it or grind it, eventually you might start wearing away the tooth enamel to the extent that you get grooves in it. Now, some of the teeth that we have from um, Bolstanes, they have these grooves in their teeth. They also have a polished area around the tooth, uh, the, uh, the incisions. Some of them don't have an incision, some of them just have the polished area, some of them have vertical stripes, some of them have horizontal stripes, some of the stripes were made by something coming down in this direction, some were made by something coming up in this direction. So, tooth as tools is a phrase that you might hear if you look at sort of early human studies, early hominids. People have been using their teeth as tools, like I said, since, well, the Stone Age, since before they were human beings. Certain peoples use their teeth kind of almost ritually as tools to hold things when they're making arrows, for example. If you need to wrap something around an arrow, you hold it in your teeth. Obviously, it's a fairly specific action that will wear away the tooth enamel, but it's possible. Another other other option is that some of this is just repeated bashing of the teeth. But that's unlikely, because that would probably have caused more shattering and chipping of the teeth. So it's not likely that this is just... And my light fell on the floor. It's full of mercury. <laughs> it's not likely that this is just people having their teeth smashed in. That causes a different type of damage. So, were they piercing their lips? Were they wearing their teeth away by using hand tools? Was this some kind of a marker of a slave, a thrall? Did you only get this tooth marking if you were enslaved at some point as a punishment or a form of ritual embarrassment? I don't know. We have no idea. The idea that it was some kind of, you know, obvious marker. I mean, how often have you seen the tops of my incisors in this video? You haven't. You'd have to do that to see most of these incisions. You'd have to be going, ah. It's hard to talk whilst you're doing this, so you can show off your interestingly scratched and modified teeth. So, it's not really that likely that it was something obvious. Maybe it was some kind of secret society, but the evidence actually points to this not really being an elite Viking thing. Some of the 
stable isotope analysis they've done on these poor dudes. Some of them only ate plants of a poor quality. Some of them had a pretty decent diet with meat and fish and all kinds of stuff. So it doesn't seem to have been something that only upper class swanky ass Viking dudes with beautifully braided blonde hair, uh, big bushy beards, muscles like watermelons, muscular beasts. No. Enslaved people had them. Young men had them, old men had them, healthy men had them, cripplingly unhealthy men with unbelievable amounts of congenital bone and joint defects had them. We don't know. We do not know why these things were done. We only know that it happened. And it seems to be pretty solidly cut off by the 12th century. So is this something to do with religion? Is this something to do with a craft that dies out? There's a lot more work to be done on this. This is one of those really cool things that is still a mystery, where we have evidence, but we don't know what it's telling us yet. We don't know if it's telling us that these people used a certain kind of tool or craft that died out by 1150 that meant that their teeth wore down. We don't know if it's religious. We have really no idea. One thing is for certain, it's not likely to have been elite Viking warriors doing it. Phrase of the week! So I didn't have a clever idea for the phrase of the week this week, because it's been another fairly heavy week work-wise, but... Or my battery will run out and I will have to go and reset. <clears throat> so, ah, my... F light again. I know a couple of you guys have been having some trouble with some of the letter sounds and with that sort of thing. <clears throat> And I'm actually going to start doing a couple of videos now and then that I'm just going to kind of throw up that are going to be Welsh pronunciation and how the letters work, because there's not really much of that on YouTube that is easily understood. So today, <clears throat> instead of an actual Welsh phrase, we're going to look at a couple of things about how Welsh letters sound. So most of the Welsh alphabet is pretty similar to the English alphabet, and... That's the first thing you need to get your head around, is that these are different alphabets. So, the Welsh alphabet has different letters, like ach, and us and ch, and th, th, th. Yeah. And then a lot of the rest of them are pretty similar. The ones that are different are things like, in English, the letter U can make an U uh or an U uh sound. In Welsh, it's an E bedol, and it makes an I uh sound. Ugh. The tongue there and go, Ugh. Ugh. Imagine a scouser saying 30. 30. Ugh. Dirty 30. Ugh. The letter Y in English is an uh in Welsh and it makes an uh sound most of the time. That's pretty much the only letter that has more than one sound. So the letter sounds in Welsh in order are a, b, k, ch. And it's a rough one. Not like the German, it's a ch. D, th, double D is always a th sound. Th. Uh, eh, v. One F is a v sound, it's a V. Two Fs, f, g, h, e, never e, always e. O, s, the alveolar lateral fricative, I think it's called. So, tongue to the roof of your mouth, like that, blow the other side, like shed the sloth in Ice Age, you don't need to like, dead easy, tongue to the roof of your mouth and blow, people struggle with it so much and I don't understand, like literally just put your tongue up, like an angry cat. Sexy cat. I'm a cat. I'm a cat. I'm a sexy cat. L. M. N. Ng. N. G. Ng. Just like in English, isn't it? Ng. Like Bangor. Uh, o. O. The O is never an O. It's always an O. So O. P. PH is F. Again. F. Like uh, Pharos. The old word for lighthouse. Uh, where do I get these examples from? Uh, no Q in Welsh, we don't bother with Q because we've got a C, so what do you need a Q for? 
Um, try and roll your R's if you can in Welsh. R, maraid, osvetridi. R, which is an H R. So think of it like W H in whip. R H R. Uh, pronounce it like an H R rather than an R H. R H doesn't really make any R H. Uh, R. So, raid. The word raid meaning. Uh, need to or have to do something. Hraid. <coughs> Hraf, which is rope. R-H-A-F-F. Hraf. Uh, s- and then S-I. <coughs> sh. Uh, which I don't think is an official letter. It, it just happens. <coughs> Dipthol. T. Th. Never the. Always a th. If it's T-H in Welsh, it's a th. Okay. Uh, I. 30. Dirty 30. Um, uh, ooh, W is an oo, duh, <laughs> and then uh. So there you go, and that's how the letters work. That's what they sound like almost all the time, except for uh, which sometimes makes an i sound. But that's way, way less irregular letter sounds than you get in English. So, <laughs> you know, so that is the Welsh alphabet in what? A couple of minutes? So there you go. The letter sounds in Welsh, they're super, super, super easy, and once you get them into your head, Welsh is completely phonetic. If you remember, it's the Welsh alphabet, not the English alphabet. So there you go. Diolch yn fawr iawn, unwaith eto, am ym uno, tan tro nesa, hwyl am y tro. So thank you very much indeed for joining me once again. Thank you to all my generous patrons, and I will see you next time. Bye for now. Teeth. Teeth. All of the teeth. Huh, oh, Bonesy. Why don't you give us a song? I'm trying to sing a song. Yeah, whatever. What did you just say to me? How dare you? Fatso.